Section 13 of The Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Eastman. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 13. The Roman Road. All the roads of our neighborhood were cheerful and friendly, having each of them pleasant qualities of their own. But this one seemed different from the others in its masterful suggestion of a serious purpose, speeding you along with a strange uplifting of the heart. The others tempted chiefly with their treasures of hedge and ditch, the rapt surprise of the first lords and ladies, the rustle of a field mouse, splash of a frog, while cool noses of brother beasts were pushed at you through gate or gap. A loiterer you had need to be did you choose one of them. So many were the tiny hands thrust out to detain you from this side and that. But this other was of a sterner sort, and even in its shedding off of bank and hedgerow, as it marched straight and full for the open downs, it seemed to declare its contempt for adventitious trappings to catch the shallow pated. When the sense of injustice or disappointment was heavy on me, and things were very black within, as on this particular day, the road of character was my choice for that solitary ramble, when I turned my back for an afternoon on a world that had unaccountably declared itself against me. The Knight's Road, we children had named it, from a sort of feeling that, if from any quarter at all, it would be down this track we might some day see Lancelot and his peers come pacing on their great war-horses, supposing that any of the stout band still survived in nooks and unexplored places. Grown-up people sometimes spoke of it as the Pilgrim's Way, but I didn't know much about pilgrims except Walter in the Horselberg story. Him I sometimes saw, breaking with haggard eyes out of yonder copse, and calling to the pilgrims as they hurried along on their desperate march to the holy city, where peace and pardon were awaiting them. All roads lead to Rome, I had once heard somebody say. And I had taken the remark very seriously, of course, and puzzled over it many days. There must have been some mistake, I concluded at last. But of one road at least, I intuitively felt it to be true. And my belief was clinched by something that fell from Miss Smedley during a history lesson about a strange road that ran right down the middle of England till it reached the coast, and then began again in France just opposite and so on undeviating through city and vineyard, right from the misty highlands to the eternal city. Uncorroborated, any statement of Miss Smedley's usually fell on incredulous ears, but here, with the road itself in evidence, she seemed, once, in a way, to have strayed into truth. Rome. It was fascinating to think that it lay at the other end of this white ribbon that rolled itself off from my feet over the distant downs. I was not quite so uninstructed as to imagine I could reach it that afternoon, but some day, I thought, if things went on being as unpleasant as they were now, some day, when Aunt Eliza had gone on a visit, we would see. I tried to imagine what it would be like when I got there. The Colosseum I knew, of course, from a woodcut in the history book, so to begin with I plumped that down in the middle. The rest had to be patched up from the little grey market town, where twice a year we went to have our hair cut. Hence, in the result, Vespasian's amphitheatre was approached by muddy little streets, wherein the Red Lion and the Blue Boar with somebody's entire along their front, and commercial room on their windows. The doctor's house of substantial red brick, 
and the façade of the new Wesleyan chapel, which we thought very fine, were the chief architectural ornaments. While the Roman populace pottered about in smocks and corduroys, twisting the tails of Roman calves and inviting each other to beer in musical Wessex. From Rome I drifted on to other cities dimly heard of. Damascus, Brighton, Aunt Eliza's ideal, Athens, and Glasgow, whose glories the gardener sang. But there was a certain sameness in my conception of all of them. That Wesleyan chapel would keep cropping up everywhere, it was easier to go a-building among those dream cities where no limitations were imposed, and one was sole architect with a free hand. Down a delectable street of cloud-built palaces I was mentally pacing, when I happened upon the artist. He was seated at work by the roadside, at a point whence the cool large spaces of the downs, juniper-studded, swept grandly westwards. His attributes proclaimed him of the artist tribe. Besides, he wore knickerbockers like myself, a garb confined, I was aware, to boys and artists. I knew I was not to bother him with questions, nor look over his shoulder and breathe in his ear. They didn't like it, this genus irritabile. But there was nothing about staring in my code of instructions, the point having somehow been overlooked. So, squatting down on the grass, I devoted myself to a passionate absorbing of every detail. At the end of five minutes there was not a button on him that I could not have passed an examination in, and the wearer himself of that homespun suit was probably less familiar with its pattern and texture than I was. Once he looked up, nodded, half held out his tobacco pouch, mechanically, as it were, then, returning it to his pocket, resumed his work, and I, my mental photography. After another five minutes or so had passed, he remarked, without looking my way, Fine afternoon we're having. Going far today? No, I'm not going any farther than this, I replied, I was thinking of going on to Rome, but I've put it off. Pleasant place, Rome, he murmured. You'll like it. It was some minutes later that he added, But I wouldn't go just now if I were you. Too jolly hot. You haven't been to Rome, have you? I inquired. Rather, he replied briefly, I live there. This was too much and my jaw dropped as I struggled to grasp the fact that I was sitting there talking to a fellow who lived in Rome. Speech was out of the question. Besides, I had other things to do. Ten solid minutes had I already spent in an examination of him as a mere stranger and artist, and now the whole thing had to be done over again from the changed point of view. So I began afresh, at the crown of his soft hat, and worked down to his solid British shoes, this time investing everything with the new Roman halo. And at last I managed to get out. But you don't really live there, do you? Never doubting the fact, but wanting to hear it repeated. Well, he said, good-naturedly overlooking the slight rudeness of my query, I live there as much as I live anywhere, about half the year sometimes. I've got a sort of a shanty there. You must come and see it some day. But do you live anywhere else as well? I went on, feeling the forbidden tide of questions surging up within me. Oh, yes, all over the place, was his vague reply, and I've got a digging somewhere off Piccadilly. Where's that? I inquired. Where's what? said he. Oh, Piccadilly. It's in London. Have you a large garden? I asked. And how many pigs have you got? I've no garden at all, he replied sadly, and they don't allow me to keep pigs, though I'd like to awfully. It's very hard. 
But what do you do all day, then? I cried. And where do you go and play, without any garden or pigs or things? When I want to play, he said gravely, I have to go and play in the street. But it's poor fun, I grant you. There's a goat, though, not far off, and sometimes I talk to him when I'm feeling lonely. But he's very proud. Goats are proud, I admitted. There's one lives near here, and if you say anything to him at all, he hits you in the wind with his head. You know what it feels like when a fellow hits you in the wind? I do well, he replied, in a tone of proper melancholy, and painted on. And have you been to any other places? I began again presently, besides Rome and Picky what's-his-name? Heaps, he said. I'm a sort of Ulysses, seen men in cities, you know. In fact, about the only place I never got to was the fortunate island. I began to like this man. He answered your questions briefly and to the point, and never tried to be funny. I felt I could be confidential with him. Wouldn't you like, I inquired, to find a city without any people in it at all? He looked puzzled. I'm afraid I don't quite understand, said he. I mean, I went on eagerly, a city where you walk in at the gates and the shops are all full of beautiful things, and the houses furnished as grand as can be, and there isn't anybody there whatever, and you go into the shops and take anything you want, chocolates and magic lanterns and inch of rubber balls, and there's nothing to pay, and you choose your own house and live there and do just as you like, and never go to bed unless you want to. The artist laid down his brush. That would be a nice city, he said better than Rome. You can't do that sort of thing in Rome, or in Piccadilly either. But I fear it's one of the places I've never been to. And you'd ask your friends, I went on, warming to my subject, only those you really like, of course, and they'd each have a house to themselves. There'd be lots of houses, and no relations at all, unless they promised they'd be pleasant, and if they weren't, they'd have to go. So you wouldn't have any relations, said the artist. Well, perhaps you're right. We have tastes in common, I see. I'd have Harold, I said reflectively, and Charlotte. They'd like it awfully. The others are getting too old. Oh, and Martha. I'd have Martha to cook and wash up and do things. You'd like Martha. She's ever so much nicer than Aunt Eliza. She's my idea of a real lady. Then I'm sure I should like her, he replied heartily. And when I come to, what do you call this city of yours? Nephilo something, did you say? I, I don't know, I replied timidly. I'm afraid it hasn't got a name, yet. The artist gazed out over the downs. The poet says, dear city of Cecrops, he said softly to himself. And wilt not thou say, dear city of Zeus? That's from Marcus Aurelius, he went on, turning again to his work. You don't know him, I suppose. You will some day. Who's he? I inquired. Oh, just another fellow who lived in Rome, he replied, dabbing away. Oh, dear, I cried disconsolately. What a lot of people seem to live at Rome, and I've never even been there but I think I'd like my city best. And so would I, he replied with unction. But Marcus Aurelius wouldn't, you know. Then we won't invite him, I said, will we? I won't if you won't, said he. And that point being settled, we were silent for a while. Do you know, he said presently, I've met one or two fellows from time to time who have been to a city like yours. Perhaps it was the same one. They won't talk much about it, only broken hints now and then, but they've been there sure enough. They don't seem to care about anything in particular, and everything's the same to them, rough or smooth. 
and sooner or later they slip off and disappear, and you never see them again. Gone back, I suppose. Of course, said I. Don't see what they ever came away for. I wouldn't. To be told you've broken things when you haven't, and stopped having tea with the servants in the kitchen, and not allowed to have a dog to sleep with you. But I've known people, too, who've gone there. The artist stared, but without incivility. Well, there's Lancelot, I went on. The book says he died, but he never seemed to read right somehow. He just went away, like Arthur. And Crusoe, when he got tired of wearing clothes and being respectable. And all the nice men in the stories who don't marry the princess, because only one man ever gets married in a book, you know. They'll be there. And the men who never come off, he said, who try like the rest, but get knocked out, or somehow miss, or break down, or get bowled over in the melee, and get no princess, nor even a second-class kingdom. Some of them'll be there, I hope. Yes, if you like, I replied, not quite understanding him. If they're friends of yours, we'll ask him, of course. What a time we shall have, said the artist reflectively, and how shocked old Marcus Aurelius will be. The shadows had lengthened uncannily. A tide of golden haze was flooding the grey-green surface of the downs, and the artist began to put his traps together, preparatory to a move. I felt very low. We would have to part, it seemed, just as we were getting on so well together. Then he stood up, and he was very straight and tall, and the sunset was in his hair and beard as he stood there, high over me. He took my hand like an equal. "'I've enjoyed our conversation very much,' he said. "'That was an interesting subject you started, and we haven't half exhausted it. We shall meet again, I hope.' "'Of course we shall,' I replied, surprised that there should be any doubt about it. "'In Rome, perhaps,' said he. "'Yes, in Rome,' I answered. "'Or picky the other place, or somewhere.' "'Or else,' said he, "'in that other city, when we've found the way there. "'And I'll look out for you, and you'll sing out as soon as you see me. "'And we'll go down the street, arm in arm, and into all the shops. "'And then I'll choose my house, and you'll choose your house, "'and we'll live there like princes and good fellows.' "'Oh, but you'll stay in my house, won't you?' I cried. "'Wouldn't ask everybody, but I'll ask you.' He affected to consider a moment. Then, "'Right,' he said. "'I believe you mean it, and I will come and stay with you. "'I won't go to anybody else if they ask me ever so much. "'And I'll stay quite a long time, too, and I won't be any trouble.' Upon this compact we parted, and I went down heartedly from the man who understood me back to the house where I never could do anything right. How was it that everything seemed natural and sensible to him, which these uncles, vicars, and other grown-up men took for the merest tomfoolery? Well, he would explain this and many another thing when we met again. The Knights Road how it always brought consolation. Was he, possibly, one of those vanished knights I had been looking for so long? Perhaps he would be in armor next time. Why not? He would look well in armor, I thought. And I would take care to get there first, and see the sunlight flash and play on his helmet and shield, as he rode up the high street of the Golden City. Meantime, there only remained the finding it. An easy matter. End of section 13. The Roman Road. Recording by Peter Eastman. Of the Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. 
Section 14. The Secret Drawer. It must surely have served as a boudoir for the ladies of old time, this little-used, rarely-entered chamber where the neglected old bureau stood. There was something very feminine in the faint hues of its faded brocades, in the rose and blue of such bits of china as yet remained, and in the delicate old-world fragrance of potpourri from the great bowl, blue and white, with funny holes in its cover, that stood on the bureau's flat top. Modern aunts disdained this out-of-the-way, backwater, upstairs room, preferring to do their accounts and grapple with their correspondence in some central position, more in the whirl of things, whence one eye could be kept on the carriage drive, while the other was alert for malingering servants and marauding children. Those aunts of a former generation, I sometimes felt, would have suited our habits better. But even by us children, to whom few places were private or reserved, the room was visited but rarely. To be sure, there was nothing particular in it that we coveted or required, only a few spindle-legged gilt-backed chairs, an old harp, on which, so the legend ran, Aunt Eliza herself used once to play, in years remote, unchronicled, a corner cupboard with a few pieces of china, and the old bureau. But one other thing the room possessed, peculiar to itself, a certain sense of privacy— a power of making the intruder feel that he was intruding, perhaps even a faculty of hinting that some one might have been sitting on those chairs, writing at the bureau, or fingering the china, just a second before one entered. No such violent word as haunted could possibly apply to this pleasant, old-fashioned chamber, which, indeed, we all rather liked, but there was no doubt it was reserved and standoffish, keeping itself to itself. Uncle Thomas was the first to draw my attention to the possibilities of the old bureau. He was pottering about the house one afternoon, having ordered me to keep at his heels for company. He was a man who hated to be left one minute alone, when his eye fell on it. "'Hm! Sheraton,' he remarked. He had a smattering of most things, this uncle, especially the vocabularies. Then he let down the flap, and examined the empty pigeonholes and dusty panelling. "'Fine bit of inlay,' he went on. "'Good work, all of it. I know the sort. There's a secret drawer in there somewhere.' Then, as I breathlessly drew near, he suddenly exclaimed, "'By Jove, I do want to smoke!' And wheeling round, he abruptly fled for the garden, leaving me with the cup dashed from my lips. What a strange thing, I mused, was this smoking, that takes a man suddenly, be he in the court, the camp, or the grove, grips him like an afrite, and whirls him off to do its imperious behests. Would it be even so with myself, I wondered, in those unknown, grown-up years to come? But I had no time to waste in vain speculations. My whole being was still vibrating to those magic syllables, secret drawer, and that particular chord had been touched that never fails to thrill responsive to such words as cave, trap-door, sliding panel, bullion, ingots, or Spanish dollars. For besides its own special bliss, who ever heard of a secret drawer with nothing in it? And, oh, I did want money so badly. I mentally ran over the list of demands which were pressing me the most imperiously. First there was the pipe I wanted to give to George Janaway. George, who was Martha's young man, was a shepherd, and a great ally of mine, and at the last fair he was at, when he bought his sweetheart fairings, as a right-minded shepherd should, he had purchased a lovely snake expressly for me, one of the wooden sort, with joints, waggling deliciously in the hand, with yellow spots on a green ground, sticky and strong-smelling, as a fresh-painted snake ought to be, and with a red flannel tongue pasted cunningly into its jaws. I loved it much, and took it to bed with me every night, till what time its spinal cord was loosed and it fell apart, and went the way of all mortal joys. I thought it so nice of George to think of me at the fair, and that's why I wanted to give him a pipe. When the young year was chill and lambing time was on, George inhabited a little wooden house on wheels, far out on the wintry downs, and saw no faces but such as were sheepish and woolly and mute, and when he and Martha were married she was going to carry his dinner out to him every day, two miles, and after it perhaps he would smoke my pipe. It seemed an idyllic sort of existence for both the parties concerned, 
but a pipe of quality, a pipe fitted to be part of a life such as this, could not be procured, so Martha informed me, for a less sum than eighteen pence, and meantime. Then there was the fourpence I owed Edward, not that he was bothering me for it, but I knew he was in need of it himself, to pay back Selina, who wanted it to make up a sum of two shillings, to buy Harold an ironclad for his approaching birthday, H.M.S. Majestic, now lying uselessly careened in the toy-shop window, just when her country had such sore need of her. And then there was that boy in the village who had caught a young squirrel, and I had never yet possessed one, and he wanted a shilling for it, but I knew that for ninepence in cash— but what was the good of these sorry, threadbare reflections? I had wants enough to exhaust any possible find of bullion, even if it amounted to half a sovereign. My only hope now lay in the magic drawer, and here I was standing and letting the precious minutes slip by. Whether findings of this sort could, morally speaking, be considered keepings, was a point that did not occur to me. The room was very still as I approached the bureau— possessed, it seemed to be, by a sort of hush of expectation. The faint odour of orris root that floated forth as I let down the flap seemed to identify itself with the yellows and browns of the old wood, till hue and scent were of one quality, and interchangeable. Even so, ere this, the potpourri had mixed itself with the tints of the old brocade, and brocade and potpourri had long been one. With expectant fingers I explored the empty pigeon-holes, and sounded the depths of the softly sliding drawers. No books that I knew of gave any general recipe for a quest like this, but the glory, should I succeed unaided, would be all the greater. To him who is destined to arrive, the fates never fail to afford, on the way, their small encouragements. In less than two minutes I had come across a rusty button-hook. This was truly magnificent. In the nursery there existed, indeed, a general button-hook, common to either sex, but none of us possessed a private and special button-hook, to lend or refuse as suited the high humour of the moment. I pocketed the treasure carefully, and proceeded. At the back of another drawer three old foreign stamps told me I was surely on the high road to fortune. Following on these bracing incentives came a dull blank period of unrewarded search— in vain I removed all the drawers and felt over every inch of the smooth surfaces, from front to back. Never a knob, spring, or projection met the thrilling fingertips. Unyielding the old bureau stood, stoutly guarding its secret, if secret it really had. I began to grow weary and disheartened. This was not the first time that Uncle Thomas had proved shallow, uninformed, a guide into blind alleys where the echoes mocked you. Was it any good persisting longer? Was anything any good whatever? In my mind I began to review past disappointments, and life seemed one long record of failure and of non-arrival. Disillusioned and depressed, I left my work and went to the window. The light was ebbing from the room, and outside seemed to be collecting itself on the horizon for its concentrated effort of sunset. Far down the garden, Uncle Thomas was holding Edward in the air, reversed and smacking him. Edward, gurgling hysterically, was striking blind fists in the direction of where he judged his uncle's stomach should rightly be. The contents of his pockets, a motley show, were strewing the lawn. Somehow, though I had been put through a similar performance an hour or two ago, myself, it all seemed very far away and cut off from me. Westwards the clouds were massing themselves in a low violet bank. Below them, to north and south, as far round as I could reach, a narrow streak of gold ran out and stretched away, straight along the horizon. Somewhere very far off a horn was being blown, clear and thin. It sounded like the golden streak grown audible, while the gold seemed the visible sound. It pricked my ebbing courage, this blended strain of music and colour, and I turned for a last effort, and fortune thereupon— as if half ashamed of the unworthy game she had been playing with me, relented, opening her clenched fist. Hardly had I put my hand once more to the obdurate wood, when, with a sort of small sigh, almost a sob, as it were, of relief, the secret drawer sprang open. I drew it out, and carried it to the window to examine it in the failing light. Too hopeless had I gradually grown in my dispiriting search to expect very much— 
and yet at a glance I saw that my basket of glass lay in fragments at my feet. No ingots or dollars were here, to crown me the little Monte Cristo of a week. Outside the distant horn had ceased its gnat song, the gold was paling to primrose, and everything was lonely and still. Within my confident little castles were tumbling down like card-houses, leaving me stripped of estate, both real and personal, and dominated by the depressing reaction. And yet, as I looked again at the small collection that lay within that drawer of disillusions, some warmth crept back to my heart as I recognized that a kindred spirit to my own had been at the making of it. Two tarnished gilt buttons, naval, apparently, a portrait of a monarch unknown to me, cut from some antique print, and deftly coloured by hand in just my own bold style of brushwork, some foreign copper coins, thicker and clumsier of make than those I hoarded myself, and a list of birds' eggs, with names of the places where they had been found. Also, a ferret's muzzle and a twist of tarry string, still faintly aromatic. It was a real boy's hoard, then, that I had happened upon. He, too, had found out the secret drawer, this happy-starred young person, and here he had stowed away his treasures, one by one, and had cherished them secretly a while. And then, what? Well, one would never know now the reason why these priceless possessions still lay here unreclaimed. But across the void stretch of years I seemed to touch hands a moment with my little comrade of seasons long since dead. I restored the drawer with its contents to the trusty bureau, and heard the spring click with a certain satisfaction. Some other boy, perhaps, would some day release that spring again. I trusted he would be equally appreciative. As I opened the door to go, I could hear from the nursery at the end of the passage shouts and yells, telling that the hunt was up. Bears, apparently, or bandits, were on the evening bill of fare, judging by the character of the noises. In another minute I would be in the thick of it, in all the warmth and light and laughter. And yet, what a long way off it all seemed, both in space and time, to me yet lingering on the threshold of that old world chamber. End of section 14. Read on November 5th, 2007, in Oceanside, California. Section 15 of The Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 15 Exit Tyrannus. The eventful day had arrived at last, the day which, when first named, had seemed, like all golden days that promise anything definite, so immeasurably remote. When it was first announced, a fortnight before, that Miss Medley was really going, the resultant ecstasies had occupied a full week, during which we blindly reveled in the contemplation and discussion of her past tyrannies, crimes, malignities, and recalling to each other this or that insult, dishonor, or physical assault, solemnly endured at a time, when deliverance was not even a small star on the horizon and in mapping out the shining days to come, with special new troubles of their own, no doubt, since this is but a workaday world, but at least free from one familiar scourge. The time that remained had been taken up by the planning of practical expressions of the popular sentiment. Under Edward's masterly direction, arrangements had been made for a flag to be run up over the hen-house at the very moment when the fly, with Miss Medley's boxes on top, and the grim oppressor herself inside, began to move off down the drive. Three brass cannons, set on the brow of the sunk fence, were to proclaim our deathless sentiments in the ears of the retreating foe. The dogs were to wear ribbons, and later, but this depended on our powers of evasiveness and dissimulation, there might be a small bonfire, with a cracker or two if the public funds could bear the unwanted strain. I was awakened by Harold digging me in the ribs, and She's going today, was the morning hymn that scattered the clouds of sleep. Strange to say, it was with no corresponding jubilation of spirits that I slowly realized the momentous fact. Indeed, as I dressed, a dull, disagreeable feeling that I could not define grew up in me, something like a physical bruise. 
Harold was evidently feeling it too, for after repeating, She is going today, in a tone more befitting the litany, he looked hard in my face for direction as to how the situation was to be taken, but I crossly bade him look sharp and say his prayers and not bother me. What could this gloom portend? that on a day of days like the present seemed to hang my heavens with black. Down at last and out in the sun, we found Edward before us, swinging on a gate and chanting a form your ditty, in which all the beasts appear in due order, jargoning in their several tongues, and every verse begins with the couplet, Now, my lads, come with me, out in the morning early. The fateful exodus of the day had evidently slipped his memory entirely. I touched him on the shoulder. She's going today, I said. Edward's carol subsided like a water tap turned off. So she is, he replied, and got down at once off the gate, and we returned to the house without another word. At breakfast Miss Smedley behaved in a most mean and uncalled for manner. The right divine of governesses to govern wrong includes no right to cry. In this usurping the prerogative of their victims, they ignored the rules of the ring and hit below the belt. Charlotte was crying, of course, but that counted for nothing. Charlotte even cried when the pigs' noses were ringed in due season, thereby evoking the cheery contempt of the operators, who asserted they liked it, and doubtless knew. But when the clad compeller, her bolts laid aside, resorted to tears, mutinous humanity had a right to feel aggrieved, and think itself placed in a false and difficult position. What would the Romans have done, supposing Hannibal had cried? History has not even considered the possibility. Rules and precedents should be strictly observed on both sides, when they are violated, the other party is justified in feeling injured. There were no lessons that morning, naturally, another grievance. The fitness of things required that we should have struggled to the last in a confused medley of moods and tenses, and parted forever, flushed with hatred, over the dismembered corpse of the multiplication table. But this thing was not to be, and I was free to stroll by myself through the garden, and combat, as best I might, this growing feeling of depression. It was a wrong system altogether, I thought, this going of people one had got used to. Things are always to continue as they had been. Change there must be, of course. Pigs, for instance, came and went with disturbing frequency. Fired, their ringing shot and passed, hotly charged and sank at last. But nature had ordered it so, and in requital had provided for rapid successors. Did you come to love a pig, and it was taken from you? Grief was quickly assuaged in the delight of selection from the new litter. But now, when it was no question of a peerless pig, but only of a governess, nature seemed helpless, and the future held no litter of oblivion. Things might be better, or they might be worse, but they would never be the same, and the innate conservatism of youth asked neither poverty nor riches, but only immunity from change. Edward slouched up alongside of me presently, with a hang-dog look on him, as if he had been caught stealing jam. What a lurk it'll be when she's really gone! he observed with a swagger obviously assumed. Grand fun, I replied dolorously, and conversation flagged. We reached the hen-house, and contemplated the banner of freedom lying ready to flaunt the breezes at the supreme moment. Shall you run it up, he asked, when the fly starts, or, or wait a little till it's out of sight? Edward gazed round him dubiously. We're going to have some rain, I think, he said, and, and it's a new flag. It would be a pity to spoil it. Perhaps I won't run it up at all. Harold came round the corner like a bison pursued by Indians. I polished up the cannons, he cried, and they look grand. Mayn't I load them now? You leave them alone, said Edward severely, or you'll be blowing yourself up. Consideration for others was not usually Edward's strong point. Don't touch the gunpowder till you're told, or you'll get your head smacked. Harold fell behind, limp, squashed, obedient. She wants me to write to her, he began presently. Says she doesn't mind the spelling, if I'll only write. Fancy her saying that. Oh, shut up, will you? said Edward savagely. And once more we were silent, with only our thoughts for sorry company. Let's go after the cops, I suggested timidly, feeling that something had to be done to relieve the tension, and cut more no bows and arrows. She gave me a knife my last birthday, said Edward moodily, never budging. It wasn't much of a knife but I wish I hadn't lost it. When my legs used to ache, I said. She sat up half the night rubbing stuff on them. I forgot all about that till this morning. There's the fly, cried Harold suddenly. I can hear it scrunching on the gravel. 
Then for the first time we turned and stared each other in the face. The fly and its contents had finally disappeared through the gate. The rumble of its wheels had died away. Yet no flag floated defiantly in the sun, no cannons proclaimed the passing of a dynasty. From out the frosted cake of our existence, fate had cut an irreplaceable segment. Turn which way we would, the void was present. We snaked off in different directions, mutually undesirous of company, and it seemed borne in upon me that I ought to go and dig my garden right over, from end to end. It didn't actually want digging. On the other hand, no amount of digging could affect it, for good or for evil. So I worked steadily, strenuously under the hot sun, stifling thought in action. At the end of an hour or so, I was joined by Edward. I've been chopping up wood, he explained, in a guilty sort of way, though nobody had called on him to account for his doings. What for? I inquired stupidly. There's piles and piles of it chopped up already. I know, said Edward, but there's no harm in having a bit over. You can never tell what may happen. But what have you been doing all this digging for? You said it was going to rain, I explained hastily. So I thought I'd get the digging done before it came. Good gardeners always tell you that's the right thing to do. It did look like rain at one time, Edward admitted, but it's passed off now. Very queer weather we're having. I suppose that's why I've felt so funny all day. Yes, I suppose it's the weather, I replied. I've been feeling funny too. The weather had nothing to do with it, as we well knew, but we would both have died rather than admit the real reason. End of section 15《of the Golden Age》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Chapter 16 The Blue Room. That nature has her moments of sympathy with man has been noted often enough, and generally as a new discovery. To us, who had never known any other condition of things, it seemed entirely right and fitting that the wind sang and sobbed in the poplar tops, and in the lulls of it, sudden spurts of rain spattered the already dusty roads. On that blusterous March day, when Edward and I awaited on the station platform the arrival of the new tutor. Needless to say, this arrangement had been planned by an aunt, from some fond idea that our shy, innocent young natures would unfold themselves during the walk from the station, and that on the revelation of each other's more solid qualities that must then inevitably ensue, an enduring friendship springing from mutual respect might be firmly based. A pretty dream, nothing more. For Edward, who foresaw that the brunt of tutorial oppression would have to be borne by him, was sulky, monosyllabic, and determined to be as negatively disagreeable as good manners would permit. It was therefore evident that I would have to be spokesman and purveyor of hollow civilities, and I was none the more amiable on that account. All courtesies, welcomes, explanations, and other court chamberlain kind of business being my special aversion. There was much of the tempestuous March weather in the hearts of both of us as we sullenly glowered along the carriage windows of the slackening train. One is apt, however, to misjudge the special difficulties of a situation, and the reception proved, after all, an easy and informal matter. In a train full so uniformly bucolic, a tutor was readily recognizable, and his portmanteau had been consigned to the luggage cart and his person conveyed into the lane before I had discharged one of my carefully considered sentences. I breathed more easily, and, looking up at our new friend as we stepped out together, remembered that we had been counting on something altogether more arid, scholastic, and severe. A boyish eager face, and a petulant pince-nez, untidy hair, a head of constant quick turns like a robin's, and a voice that kept breaking into alto. These were all very strange and new, but not in the least terrible. He proceeded jerkily through the village, with glances on this side and that, and charming, he broke out presently, quite too charming and delightful. I had not counted on this sort of thing, and glanced for help to Edward who, hands in pockets, looked grimly down his nose. He had taken his line and meant to stick to it. Meantime, our friend had made an imaginary spyglass out of his fist, and was squinting through it at something I could not perceive. What an exquisite bit, he burst out. 
Fifteenth century? No. Yes, it is. I began to feel puzzled, not to say alarmed. It reminded me of the butcher in the Arabian Nights, whose common joints, displayed on the shop front, took to a startled public the appearance of dismembered humanity. This man seemed to see the strangest things in our dull familiar surroundings. Ah, he broke out again, as we jogged on between hedgerows, and that field now, backed by the downs, with the rain cloud brooding over it, that's all David Cox, every bit of it. That field belongs to Farmer Larkin, I explained politely, for of course he could not be expected to know. I'll take you over to Farmer Cox tomorrow if he's a friend of yours, but there's nothing to see there. Edward, who was hanging sullenly behind, made a face at me as if to say, What sort of lunatic have you got here? It has a true pastoral character, this country of yours, went on our enthusiast, with just that added touch in cottage and farmstead, relics of a bygone art, which makes our English landscape so divine, so unique. Really, this grasshopper was becoming a burden. These familiar fields and farms, of which we know every blade and stick, had done nothing that I knew of to be bespattered with adjectives in this way. I had never thought of them as divine, unique, or anything else. They were, well, they were just themselves, and there was an end of it. Despairingly, I jogged Edward in the ribs, as a sign to start rational conversation, but he only grinned and continued obdurate. You can see the house now, I remarked presently, and that's Selina chasing the donkey in the paddock. Or is it the donkey chasing Selina? I can't quite make out, but it's them, anyhow. Needless to say, he exploded with a full charge of adjectives. Exquisite, he rapped out. So mellow and harmonious, and so entirely in keeping. I could see from Edward's face that he was thinking who ought to be in keeping. Such possibilities of romance now in those old gables. If you mean the garrets, I said, there's a lot of old furniture in them and one is generally full of apples, and the bats get in sometimes under the eaves and flop about till they go up with hairbrushes and things and drive them out, but there's nothing else in them that I know of. Oh, but there must be more than bats, he cried. Don't tell me there are no ghosts. I shall be deeply disappointed if there aren't any ghosts. I did not think it worthwhile to reply, feeling really unequal to this sort of conversation. Besides, we were nearing the house when my task would be ended. Aunt Eliza met us at the door, and in the crossfire of adjectives that ensued, both of them talking at once as grown-up folk have a habit of doing, we two slipped round to the back of the house and speedily put several solid acres between us and civilization, for fear of being ordered into tea in the drawing-room. By the time we returned, our new importation had gone up to dress for dinner, so till the morrow at least we were free of him. Meanwhile the march wind, after dropping a while at sundown, had been steadily increasing in volume, and although I fell asleep at my usual hour, about midnight I was wakened by the stress and cry of it. In the bright moonlight, wind-swung branches tossed and swayed eerily across the blinds. There was rumbling in chimneys, whistling in keyholes, and everywhere a clamor and a call. Sleep was out of the question, and, sitting up in bed, I looked round. Edward sat up too. I was wondering when you were going to wake he said. It's no good trying to sleep through this. I vote we get up and do something. I'm game, I replied. Let's play at being in a ship at sea. The plaint of the old house under the buffeting wind suggested this, naturally. And we can be wrecked on an island or left on a raft. Whichever you choose. But I like an island best myself, because there's more things on it. Edward, on reflection, negatived the idea. It would make too much noise, he pointed out. There is no fun playing at ships unless you can make a jolly good row. The door creaked, and a small figure in white slipped cautiously in. Thought I heard you talking, said Charlotte. We don't like it. We're afraid. Selina, too. She'll be here in a minute. She's putting on her new dressing gown she's so proud of. His arms round his knees, Edward cogitated deeply until Selina appeared, barefooted, and looking slim and tall in the new dressing gown. Then, look here, he exclaimed. Now we're all together, I vote we go and explore. You're always wanting to explore, I said. What on earth is there to explore for in this house? Biscuits, said the inspired Edward. Hooray, come on. 
chimed in Harold, sitting up suddenly. He had been awake all the time, but had been shamming asleep lest he should be fagged to do anything. It was indeed a fact, as Edward had remembered, that our thoughtless elders occasionally left the biscuits out, a prize for the night-walking adventurer with nerves of steel. Edward tumbled out of bed and pulled a baggy old pair of knickerbockers over his bare shanks. Then he girt himself with a belt, into which he thrust, on the one side a large wooden pistol, on the other an old single stick. And finally he donned a big slouch hat, once an uncle's, that we used for playing Guy Fox and Charles II of a tree in. Whatever the audience, Edward, if possible, always dressed for his parts with care and conscientiousness. While Harold and I, true Elizabethans, cared little about the mounting of the piece, so long as the real dramatic hurt of it beat sound. Our commander now enjoined on us a silence deep as the grave, reminding us that Aunt Eliza usually slept with an open door past which we had to file. But we'll take the shortcut through the blue room, said the very Solita. Of course, said Edward approvingly. I forgot about that. Now then, you lead the way. The blue room had in prehistoric times been added to by taking in a superfluous passage, and so not only had the advantage of two doors, but enabled us to get to the head of the stairs without passing the chamber wherein our dragon ant lay couched. It was rarely occupied, except when a casual uncle came down for the night. We entered in noiseless file, the room being plunged in darkness, except for a bright strip of moonlight on the floor, across which we must pass for our exit. On this our leading lady chose to pause, seizing the opportunity to study the hang of her new dressing gown. Greatly satisfied thereat, she proceeded, after the feminine fashion, to peacock and to pose, pacing a minuet down the moonlit patch with an imaginary partner. This was too much for Edward's histrionic instincts, and after a moment's pause, he drew his single stick, and with flourishes meet for the occasion, sewed onto the stage. A struggle ensued on approved lines, at the end of which Selina was tapped slowly and with unction, and her corpse borne from the chamber by the ruthless cavalier. The rest of us rushed after in a clump, with capers and gesticulations of delight, the special charm of the performance lying in the necessity for its being carried out with the dumbest of dumb shows. Once out on the dark landing, the noise of the storm without told us that we had exaggerated the necessity for silence. So, grasping the tails of each other's nightgowns even as alpine climbers rope themselves together in perilous places, we fared stoutly down the staircase moraine, and across the green glacier of the hall, to where a faint glimmer from the half-open door of the drawing-room beckoned to us like friendly hostel lights. Entering, we found that our thriftless seniors had left the sound red heart of a fire, easily coaxed into cheerful blaze, and biscuits, a plateful, smiled at us in an encouraging sort of way, together with the halves of a lemon, already once squeezed but still suckable. The biscuits were righteously shared, the lemon segments passed from mouth to mouth and as we squatted round the fire, with genial worms consoling our unclad limbs, we realized that so many nocturnal perils had not been braved in vain. It's a funny thing, said Edward as we chatted, how I hate this room in the daytime. It always means having your face washed and your hair brushed and talking silly company talk. But tonight it's really quite jolly, looks different somehow. I never can make out, I said, what people come here to tea for. They can have their own tea at home if they like. They're not poor people, with jam and things, and drink out of their saucer and suck their fingers and enjoy themselves. But they come here from a long way off, and sit up straight with their feet off the bars of their chairs, and have one cup, and talk the same sort of stuff every time. Solena sniffed disdainfully. You don't know anything about it, she said. In society, you have to call on each other. It's the proper thing to do. Pooh, you're not in society said Edward politely, and what's more, you never will be. Yes, I shall some day, retorted Selina, but I shan't ask you to come and see me, so there. Wouldn't come if you did, growled Edward. Well, you won't get the chance, rejoined her sister, claiming her right of the last word. There was no heed about these little amenities, which made up, as we understood it, the art of polite conversation. I don't like society people put in Harold from the sofa, where he was sprawling at full length, a sight the daylight hours would have blushed to witness. There were some of them here this afternoon, 
when you two had gone off to the station. Oh, and I found a dead mouse on the lawn, and I wanted to skin it, but I wasn't sure I knew how by myself. And they came out into the garden and patted my head. I wish people wouldn't do that. And one of them asked me to pick her a flower. Don't know why she couldn't pick it herself, but I said, All right, I will if you'll hold my mouse. But she screamed and threw it away. And Augustus, the cat, got it and ran away with it. I believe it was really his mouse all the time, because he'd been looking about as if he had lost something. So I wasn't angry with him. But what did she want to throw away my mouse for? You have to be careful with mice, reflected Edward. They're such slippery things. Do you remember we were playing with a dead mouse once on the piano? And the mouse was Robinson Crusoe, and the piano was the island. And somehow Crusoe slipped down inside the island into its works, and we couldn't get him out, though we tried rakes and all sorts of things till the tuner came. And that wasn't till a week after, and then... Here Charlotte, who had been nodding solemnly, fell over into the fender. And we realized that the wind had dropped at last, and the house was lapped in a great stillness. Our vacant beds seemed to be calling to us imperiously, and we were all glad when Edward gave the signal for retreat. At the top of the staircase, Harold unexpectedly turned mutinous, insisting on his right to slide down the banisters in a free country. Circumstances did not allow of argument. I suggested frogs marching instead, and frogs marched he accordingly was the procession passing solemnly across the moonlit blue room, with Harold horizontal and limply submissive. Snug in bed at last, I was just slipping off into slumber when I heard Edward explode with chuckle and snort. By Jove, he said, I forgot all about it, the new tutor slipping in the blue room. Lucky he didn't wake up and catch us, I grunted drowsily, and both of us, without another thought on the matter, sank into well-earned repose. Next morning, we came down to breakfast braced to grapple with fresh adversity, but were surprised to find our garrulous friend of the previous day, who was late in making his appearance, strangely silent and apparently preoccupied. Having polished off our porridge, we ran out to feed the rabbits, explaining to them that a beast of a tutor would prevent their enjoying so much of our society as formerly. On returning to the house at the fated hour appointed for study, we were thunderstruck to see the station cart disappearing down the drive, frighted with her new acquaintance. Aunt Eliza was brutally uncommunicative, but she was overheard to remark casually that she thought the man must be a lunatic. In this theory we were only too ready to concur, dismissing thereafter the whole matter from our minds. Some weeks later it happened that Uncle Thomas, while paying us a flying visit, produced from his pocket a copy of the latest weekly Psyche, a journal of the unseen, and proceeded laboriously to rate himself of much incomprehensible humor, apparently at our expense. We bore it patiently, with the first grain demanded by convention, anxious to get at the source of inspiration, which it presently appeared lay in a paragraph circumstantially describing our modest and humdrum habitation. Case 3, it began. The following particulars were communicated by a young member of the society, of undoubted property and earnestness, and are a chronicle of actual and recent experience. A fairly accurate description of the house followed, with details that were unmistakable. But to this there succeeded a flood of meaningless drivel about apparitions, nightly visitants, and the like, writ in a manner betokening a disordered mind, coupled with a feeble imagination. The fellow was not even original. All the old material was there, the storm at night, the haunted chamber, the white lady, the murder re-enacted, and so on, already worn threadbare in many a Christmas number. No one was able to make head or tail of the stuff, or of its connection with our quiet mansion. And yet Edward, who had always suspected the man, persisted in maintaining that our tutor of a brief span was, somehow or other, at the bottom of it. End of section 16「Section 17 of the Golden Age」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham Section 17 A Falling Out 
Harold told me the main facts of this episode some time later, in bits and with reluctance. It was not a recollection he cared to talk about. The crude blank misery of a moment is apt to leave a dull bruise which is slow to depart, if it ever does so entirely, and Harold confesses to a twinge or two, still, at times, like the veteran who brings home a bullet inside him from Marshall Plains oversea. He knew he was a brute the moment he had done it. Selina had not meant to worry, only to comfort and assist. But his soul was one raw, sore within him, when he found himself shut up in the schoolroom after hours, merely for insisting that seven times seven amounted to forty-seven. The injustice of it seemed so flagrant. Why not forty-seven as much as forty-nine? One number was no prettier than the other to look at, and it was evidently only a matter of arbitrary taste and preference, and, anyhow, it had always been forty-seven to him, and would be to the end of time. So when Selina came in out of the sun, leaving the trappers or the forest behind her, and putting off the glory of being an Apache's caw in order to hear him his tables and win his release, Harold turned on her venomously, rejected her kindly overtures, and ever drove his elbow into her sympathetic ribs in determination to be left alone in the glory of sulks. The fit passed directly, his eyes were opened and his soul sat in the dust as he sorrowfully began to cast about for some atonement heroic enough to solve the wrong. Of course, poor Selina looked for no sacrifice nor heroics whatever. She didn't even want him to say he was sorry. If he would only make it up, she would have done the apologizing part herself. But that was not a boy's way. Something solid, Harold felt, was due from him, and until that was achieved, making up must not be thought of, in order that the final effect might not be spoiled. Accordingly, when his release came, and poor Selina hung about trying to catch his eye, Harold, possessed by the demon of a distorted motive, avoided her steadily, though he was bleeding inwardly at every minute of delay, and came to me instead. Needless to say, I approved his plan highly. It was so much more high-toned than just going and making up tamely, which anyone could do and a girl who had been jobbed in the ribs by a hostile elbow could not be expected for a moment to overlook it, without the liniment of an offering to soothe her injured feelings. "'I know what she wants most,' said Harold. "'She wants a set of tea-things in the toy-shop window, with the red and blue flowers on them. She's wanted it for months, cause her dolls are getting big enough to have real afternoon tea, and she wants it so badly that she won't walk that side of the street when we go into the town. But it costs five shillings.' Then we set to work seriously, and devoted the afternoon to a realization of assets and the composition of a budget that might have been dated without shame from Whitehall. The result worked out as follows. My one uncle, unspent through having been lost for nearly a week, turned up at last in the straw of the dog kennel, two shillings and six pennies, carry forward two and six, brought forward two and six, by advance from me on security of next uncle, and failing that to be called in at Christmas, one shilling, by shaken out of missionary box with the help of a knife blade, they were our own pennies and the first levy, four pennies, by bet due from Edward, for walking across the field where former Larkin's bull was, and Edward bet him two pence he wouldn't, called in with difficulty, two pennies, by advance from Martha, on no security at all, only you mustn't tell your aunt, one shilling, total, five shillings, and at last we breathed again. The rest promised to be easy. Selina had a tea party at five on the morrow, with the cheap dulled wooden tea things that had served her successive dolls from babyhood. Harold would slip off directly after dinner, going alone so as not to arouse suspicion, as we were not allowed to go into the town by ourselves. It was nearly two miles to our small metropolis, but there would be plenty of time for him to go and return even laden with the olive branch neatly packed in shavings. Besides, he might meet the butcher, who was his friend and would give him a lift. Then, finally, at five, the rapture of the new tea service descended from the skies, and retribution made, making up at last, without loss of dignity. With the event before us, we thought it a small thing that twenty-four hours more of alienation and pretended sulks must be kept up on Harold's part. But Selina, who naturally knew nothing of the treat in store for her, moped for the rest of the evening, and took a very heavy heart to bed. When next day the hour for action arrived, Harold debated Olympian attention with an easy modesty born of long practice, and made off for the front gate. Selina, who had been keeping her eye upon him, 
thought he was going down to the pond to catch frogs, a joy they had planned to share together, and made after him. But Harold, though he heard her footsteps, continued sternly on his high mission, without even looking back, and Selina was left to wander disconsolately among flower beds that had lost for her all scent and color. I sighed all, and although cold reason approved our line of action, instinct told me we were brutes. Harold reached the town, so he recounted afterwards, in record time, having run most of the way for fear the tea things, which had reposed six months in the window, should be snapped up by some other conscience-stricken lacerator of a sister's feelings, and it seemed hardly credible to find them still there, and their owner willing to part with them for the price march of the ticket. He paid his money down at once, that there should be no drawing back from the bargain, and then, as the tea things had to be taken out of the window and packed, and the afternoon was yet young, he thought he might treat himself to a taste of urban joys and le vie de bohème. Shops came first, of course, and he flattened his nose successively against the window with the india rubber balls in it and the clockwork locomotive, and against the barber's window with wigs on blocks reminding him of uncles and shaving cream that looked so good to eat, and the grocer's window displaying more currants than the whole British population could possibly consume without a special effort, and the window of the bank wherein gold was thought so little off that it was dealt about in shovels. Next there was the marketplace, with all its clamorous joys, and when the runaway calf came down the street like a cannonball, Harold felt that he had not lived in vain. The whole place was so brimful of excitement that he had quite forgotten the why and the wherefore of his being there, when a sight of the church clock recalled him to his better self, and sent him flying out of the town, as he realized he had only just time enough left to get back in. If he were after his appointed hour, he would not only miss his high triumph, but probably would be detected as a transgressor of bounds, a crime before which a private opinion on multiplication sank to nothingness. So he jogged along on his homeward way, thinking of many things, and probably talking to himself a good deal, as his habit was, and had covered nearly half the distance, when suddenly a deadly sinking in the pit of his stomach, a paralysis of every limb, around him a world extinct of light and music a black sun and a reeling sky. He had forgotten the tea things. It was useless, it was hopeless, all was over, and nothing could now be done. Nevertheless, he turned and ran back wildly, blindly, choking with the big sobs that evoked neither pity nor comfort from a merciless mocking world around, a stitch in his side, dust in his eyes, a black despair clutching at his heart. So he stumbled on, with leaden legs and bursting sides, till, as if fate had not yet dealt him her last worst buffer, on turning a corner in the road, he almost ran under the wheels of a dog-cart, in which, as it pulled up, was apparent the portly form of Farmer Larkin, the arch-enemy, whose ducks he had been shying stones at that very morning. Had Harold been in his right and unclouded senses, he would have vanished through the hedge some seconds earlier, rather than pain the farmer by any unpleasant reminiscences which his appearance might call up. But as things were, he could only stand and blubber hopelessly, caring, indeed, little now, what further ill might befall him. The farmer, for his part, surveyed the desolate figure with some astonishment, calling out in no unfriendly accents, Why, Master Harold, whatever be the matter, bain't running away be? Then Harold, with the unnatural courage born of desperation, flung himself on the step, and climbing into the cart, fell in the straw at the bottom of it sobbing out that he wanted to go back, go back. The situation had a vagueness, but the farmer, a man of action rather than words, swung his horse round smartly, and they were in the town again by the time Harold had recovered himself sufficiently to furnish some details. As they drove up to the shop, the woman was waiting at the door with the parcel, and hardly a minute seemed to have elapsed since the black crisis, or they were bowling along swiftly home, the precious parcel hugged in a close embrace and now the farmer came out in quite a new and unexpected light. Never a word did he say of broken fences and hurdles, of trampled crops and harried flocks and herds. One would have thought the man had never possessed the head of livestock in his life. Instead, he was deeply interested in the whole dolorous quest of the tea things, and sympathized with Harold on the disputed point in mathematics, as if he had been himself at the same stage of education. As they neared home, Harold found himself, to his surprise, sitting up and chatting to his new friend like man to man, and before he was dropped at a convenient gap in the garden hedge, 
He had promised that when Selina gave her first public tea party, little Miss Larkin should be invited to come and bring her whole sawdust family along with her, and the former appeared as pleased and proud as if he had been asked to a garden party at Marlborough House. Really, those Olympians have certain good points far down in them. I shall have to leave off abusing them some day. At the hour of five, Selina, having spent the afternoon searching for Harold in all his accustomed haunts, sat down disconsolately to tea with her dolls, who ungenerously refused to wait beyond the appointed hour. The wooden tea things seemed more chipped than usual, and the dolls themselves had more of wax and sawdust and less of human color and intelligence about them than she ever remembered before. It was then that Harold burst in, very dusty, his stockings at his heels, and the channels ploughed by tears still showing on his grimy cheeks, and Selina was at last permitted to know that he had been thinking of her ever since his ill-judged exhibition of temper, and that his sulks had not been the genuine article, nor had he gone frogging by himself. It was a very happy hostess who dispensed hospitality that evening to a glassy-eyed, stiff-kneed circle, and many a dollish gaucherie that would have been severely checked on ordinary occasions was as much overlooked as if it had been a birthday. But Harold and I, in our stupid masculine way, thought all her happiness sprang from possession of the long coveted tea service. End of section 17The Golden Age. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. The Golden Age by Kenneth Graham. Section 18. Lucisti Satis. Among the many fatuous ideas that possessed the Olympian noddle, this one was preeminent, that, being Olympians, they could talk quite freely in our presence on subjects of the closest import to us, so long as names, dates, and other landmarks were ignored. We were supposed to be denied the faculty for putting two and two together, and, like the monkeys, who very sensibly refrain from speech, lest they should be set to earn their livings, we were careful to conceal our capabilities for a simple syllogism. Thus we were rarely taken by surprise, and so were considered by our disappointed elders to be apathetic and to lack the divine capacity for wonder. Now the daily output of the letter-bag, with the mysterious discussions that ensued thereon, had speedily informed us that Uncle Thomas was entrusted with a mission, a mission, too, affecting ourselves. Uncle Thomas's missions were many and various, a self-important man, one liking the business while protesting that he sank under the burden. He was the missionary, so to speak, of our remote habitation. The matching a ribbon, the running down to the stores, the interviewing a cook, these and similar duties lent constant colour and variety to his vacant life in London, and helped to keep down his figure. When the matter, however, had in our presence to be referred to with nods and pronouns, with significant hiatuses and interpolations in the French tongue, then the red flag was flown, the storm-cone hoisted, and, by a studious pretense of inattention, we were not long in plucking out the heart of the mystery." To cinch our conclusion, we descended suddenly and together on Martha, proceeding, however, not by simple inquiry as to facts, that would never have done, but by informing her that the air was full of school, and that we knew all about it, and then challenging denial. Martha was a trusty soul, but a bad witness for the defence, and we soon had it all out of her. The word had gone forth, the school had been selected, the necessary sheets were hemming even now, and Edward was the designated and appointed victim. It had always been before us as an inevitable born, this strange unknown thing called school, and yet, perhaps I should say consequently, we had never seriously set ourselves to consider what it really meant. But now that the grim spectre loomed imminent, stretching lean hands for one of our flock, it behoved us to face the situation, to take soundings in this uncharted sea, and find out whither we were drifting. Unfortunately, the data in our possession were absolutely insufficient, and we knew not whither to turn for exact information. Uncle Thomas could have told us all about it, of course. He had been there himself once, in the dim and misty past. But an unfortunate conviction that nature had intended him for a humorist tainted all his evidence, besides making it wearisome to hear. Again, of such among our contemporaries as we had approached, 
the trumpets gave forth an uncertain sound. According to some, it meant larks, revels, emancipation, and a foretaste of the bliss of manhood. According to others, the majority, alas, it was a private and peculiar Hades that could give the original institution points and a beating. When Edward was observed to be swaggering round with a jaunty air and his chest stuck out, I knew that he was contemplating his future from the one point of view. When, on the contrary, he was subdued and unaggressive, and sought the society of his sisters, I recognized that the other aspect was in the ascendant. "'You can always run away, you know,' I used to remark consolingly on these latter occasions, and Edward would brighten up wonderfully at the suggestion, while Charlotte melted into tears before her vision of a brother with blistered feet and an empty belly, passing nights of frost, neath the lee of windy haystacks. It was to Edward, of course, that the situation was chiefly productive of anxiety, and yet the ensuing change in my own circumstances and position furnished me also with food for grave reflection. Hitherto I had acted mostly to orders. Even when I had devised and counselled any particular devilry, it had been carried out on Edward's approbation, and, as eldest, at his special risk. Henceforward I began to be anxious of the bugbear responsibility, and to realise what a soul-throttling thing it is. True, my new position would have its compensations. Edward had been masterful exceedingly, imperious, perhaps a little narrow, impassioned for hard facts, and with scant sympathy for make-believe. I should now be free and untrammelled. In the conception and carrying out of a scheme, I could accept and reject, to better artistic purpose. It would, moreover, be needless to be a radical any more. Radical I never was, really, by nature or by sympathy. The part had been thrust on me one day, when Edward proposed to foist the House of Lords on our small republic. The principles of the thing he set forth learnedly and well, and it all sounded promising enough, till he went on to explain that, for the present at least, he proposed to be the House of Lords himself, we others were to be the Commons. There would be promotions, of course, he added, dependent on service and on fitness, and open to both sexes, and to me in especial he held out hopes of speedy advancement. But in its initial stages the thing wouldn't work properly unless he were first and only lord. Then I put my foot down promptly and said it was all rot, and I didn't see the good of any house of lords at all. Then you must be a low radical, said Edward with fine contempt. The inference seemed hardly necessary, but what could I do? I accepted the situation, and said firmly, Yes, I was a low radical. In this monstrous character I had been obliged to masquerade ever since, but now I could throw it off, and look the world in the face again. And yet, did this and other gains really outbalance my losses? Henceforth I should, it was true, be leader and chief, but I should also be the buffer between the Olympians and my little clan. To Edward this had been nothing. He had withstood the impact of Olympus without flinching, like Tenerife or Atlas unremoved. But was I equal to the task? And was there not rather a danger that, for the sake of peace and quietness, I might be tempted to compromise, compound, and make terms, sinking thus by successive lapses into the blameless prig I don't mean, of course, that I thought out my thoughts to the exact point here set down. In those fortunate days of old one was free from the hard necessity of transmuting the vague idea into the mechanical, inadequate medium of words. But the feeling was there, that I might not possess the qualities of character for so delicate a position. The unnatural halo round Edward got more pronounced, his own demeanour more responsible and dignified, with the arrival of his new clothes. When his trunk and play-box were sent in, the approaching cleavage between our brother, who now belonged to the future, and ourselves, still claimed by the past, was accentuated indeed. His name was painted on each of them, in large letters, and after their arrival their owner used to disappear mysteriously, and be found eventually wandering round his luggage, murmuring to himself, Edward blank, in a rapt, remote sort of way. It was a weakness, of course, and pointed to a soft spot in his character, but those who can remember the sensation of first seeing their names in print will not think hardly of him. As the short days sped by, and the grim event cast its shadow longer and longer across our threshold, an unnatural politeness, 
a civility scarce canny began to pervade the air. In those latter hours Edward himself was frequently heard to say, "'Please,' and also, "'Would you mind fetching that ball?' while Harold and I would sometimes actually find ourselves trying to anticipate his wishes. As for the girls, they simply grovelled. The Olympians, too, in their uncouth way, by gift of carnal delicacies and such-like indulgence, seemed anxious to demonstrate that they had hitherto misjudged this one of us. Altogether the situation grew strained and false, and I think a general relief was felt when the end came. We all trooped down to the station, of course. It is only in later years that the farce of seeing people off is seen in its true colours. Edward was the life and soul of the party, and if his gaiety struck one at times as being a trifle overdone, it was not a moment to be critical. As we tramped along, I promised him I would ask Farmer Larkin not to kill any more pigs till he came back for the holidays, and he said he would send me a proper catapult, the real, lethal article, not a kid's plaything. Then suddenly, when we were about halfway down, one of the girls fell a-snivelling. The happy few who dare to laugh at the woes of seasickness will perhaps remember how, on occasion, the sudden collapse of a fellow voyager before their very eyes has caused them hastily to revise their self-confidence, and resolve to walk more humbly for the future. Even so it was with Edward, who turned his head aside, feigning an interest in the landscape. It was but for a moment— then he recollected the hat he was wearing, a hard bowler, the first of that sort he had ever owned. He took it off, examined it, and felt it over. Something about it seemed to give him strength, and he was a man once more. At the station Edward's first care was to dispose his boxes on the platform, so that every one might see the labels and the lettering thereon. One did not go to school for the first time every day. Then he read both sides of his ticket carefully, shifted it to every one of his pockets in turn, and finally fell to chinking of his money to keep his courage up. We were all dry of conversation by this time, and could only stand round and stare in silence at the victim decked for the altar. And, as I looked at Edward in new clothes of a manly cut, with a hard hat upon his head, a railway ticket in one pocket, and money of his own in the other, money to spend as he liked, and no questions asked, I began to feel dimly how great was the gulf already yawning betwixt us. Fortunately I was not old enough to realise further that here on this little platform the old order lay at its last gasp, and that Edward might come back to us, but it would not be the Edward of yore, nor could things ever be the same again. When the train steamed up at last, we all boarded it impetuously with the view of selecting the one peerless carriage to which Edward might be entrusted, with the greatest comfort and honour, and as each one found the ideal compartment at the same moment, and vociferously maintained its merits, he stood some chance for a time of being left behind. A porter settled the matter by heaving him through the nearest door, and as the train moved off, Edward's head was thrust out of the window, wearing on it an unmistakable first-quality grin that he had been saving up somewhere for the supreme moment. Very small and white his face looked, on the long side of the retreating train. But the grin was visible, undeniable, stoutly maintained, till a curve swept him from our sight, and he was borne away in the dying rumble, out of our placid backwater, out into the busy world of rubs and knocks and competition, out into the new life. When a crab has lost a leg, his gait is still more awkward than his wont, till time and healing nature make him totus teres atque rotundus once more. We straggled back from the station disjointedly, Harold, who was very silent, sticking close to me his last slender props, while the girls in front, their heads together, were already reckoning up the weeks to the holidays. Home at last, Harold suggested one or two occupations of a spicy and contraband flavour, but though we did our manful best, there was no knocking any interest out of them. Then I suggested others, with the same want of success. Finally we found ourselves sitting silent on an upturned wheelbarrow, our chins on our fists, staring haggardly into the raw new conditions of our changed life, the ruins of a past, behind our backs. And all the while Selina and Charlotte were busy stuffing Edward's rabbits with unwanted forage, bilious and green, polishing up the cage of his mice till the occupants raved and swore like householders in springtime, 
and collecting materials for new bows and arrows, whips, boats, guns, and four-in-hand harness, against the return of Ulysses. Little did they dream that the hero, once back from Troy and all its onsets, would scornfully condemn their clumsy but laborious armory as rot and humbug, and only fit for kids. This, with many another like awakening, was mercifully hidden from them. Could the veil have been lifted, and the girls permitted to see Edward as he would appear a short three months hence, ragged of attire and lawless of tongue, a scorner of tradition, and an adept in strange new physical tortures, one who would in the same half-hour dismember a doll and shatter a hallowed belief, in fine, a sort of swaggering captain, fresh from the Spanish main, could they have had the least hint of this? Well, then perhaps. But which of us is of mental fibre to stand the test of a glimpse into futurity? Let us only hope that, even with certain disillusionment ahead, the girls would have acted precisely as they did. And perhaps we have reason to be very grateful that, both as children and long afterwards, we are never allowed to guess how the absorbing pursuit of the moment will appear, not only to others but to ourselves, a very short time hence. So we pass, with a gusto and a heartiness that to an onlooker would seem almost pathetic, from one droll devotion to another misshapen passion, and who shall care to play Radamantus, to appraise the record, and to decide how much of it is solid achievement, and how much the merest child's play. End of section 18, and the end of The Golden Age, by Kenneth Graham. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.